Let me introduce you to Reynolds Maston. Uh, Reynolds is here representing uh, the CMPA, uh, the Canadian Media Producer Production Association, I guess it is, um, and a study that they released just a month or two ago in February, I think, uh, on how uh, what what the digital future is of, of the uh, Canadian production industry and some of the interesting challenges and opportunities uh, that they see on the horizon. It certainly created a very interesting panel discussion at uh, CMPA's primetime conference back in February, and uh, Reynolds will give you, he's caught his breath, I hope. Um, <laughs> he only was flying from St. John's, it's not that big a deal. There's no, no jet lag involved here. He's going to give you some highlights. To begin with, um, my thanks to MDC for inviting me to speak to this report and for the long-standing partnership that we have with OMDC. And this report, Content Everywhere, is actually a kind of a sequel to a previous report that we did with the OMDC and the Canada Media Fund, which also uh, sponsored uh, Content Everywhere, that looked at what uh, Canadian broadcasters were paying for uh, digital rights. Um, and the conclusion of that report two years ago was uh, not very much, um, if anything at all. And so uh, Catherine Tegdu authored that report and also was the primary author on this report. When she and I sat down to talk about what the sequel should look like. Given the results of the first report, we thought we should be going further afield. Um, and certainly at the association, our focus increasingly is on providing market intelligence to producers to enable them to create and market content, not just in Canada, but for an international audience. And so it was for that reason that we decided to look at a very interesting uh, phenomenon that has occurred just in the two years since we published the previous report uh, in the United States primarily, and this was the focus of this report, which did attract a little bit of criticism after it was published, which maybe we can get to at some point. But, um, and that phenomenon was the transition by the big major uh, internet uh, portals in the United States, the, the Googles of this world, uh, the Netflixes, the Hulus, the Yahoos, the transition that they're beginning to make uh, from producing a lot of either text-based content or uh, being the platform for amateur video content and transitioning to more professionally produced original content made specifically for those platforms and targeted at the audiences of those platforms. And at the same time, we have another phenomenon that's become well entrenched in this country, and that is that Canadians are uh, the biggest uh, consumers of online video content in the world. And so we were trying to look at how we could maybe marry those two things, always in the back of our minds thinking about the potential public policy implications of how do we access this giant emerging digital marketplace in the United States. So our primary focus was to provide that market intelligence, to take a look at what those players were beginning to do in the United States, and also to provide a few very tangible case studies um, of those creators and producers in the US who've been able to really actually make money producing digital video content for the internet. So one of the things that we looked at, and uh, I've just picked Google uh, as an example of, of a case study um, analysis that's provided in the report. Um, some of you might have heard a little bit about this already. Uh, about eight, 10 months ago, um, Google announced that uh, it wanted to create a, uh, a package of digital channels. Um, and it basically sent out an RFP to the primarily the LA-based production community, um, and basically said to them, we've got 100 million bucks to spend to create these channels. Um, come to us with your pitches and proposals, um, and we'll pick. Um, and I, I believe they sort of cut it down to 600 applications that were initially sort of made the first cut. And then they ultimately greenlit um, 100 of those applications. And what was very interesting about that is that um, Google has always sort of um, projected itself as taking a more Silicon Valley approach to how it does business and has always sort of contrasted itself with the Hollywood approach where the focus has always been on creating scarcity for content and controlling the distribution platforms for content, whereas Silicon Valley is always about abundance and sort of ground up way of doing things. And yet 
interestingly here with what Google did, they took the same approach that a US network would typically take to determining which pitches they were going to, to green light. And the thing that they also did that was quite interesting was when they made the final decisions, they picked a few celebrities like the Ashton Kutchers of this world, but they also selected some of their own YouTube stars that have built massive audiences globally to begin populating some of these new channels, and that rollout uh, just recently began. What did concern us a lot is that, to our knowledge, none of the channels selected um, are with Canadian producers. Um, and we, we were down in Los Angeles, we met with one of the, the heads of content for Google who uh, uh, were, was spearheading this initiative. And they're very much aware of the Canadian market, they said all the right things. They're very much aware that Canadians are number one consumers of content, and we were given assurances that uh, in the event that this initiative is a success, they do intend to roll it out globally and be doing outreach to producers in other parts of the world, and Canada being probably the natural next place that they would go. Um, another just interesting note about how they packaged the deals. Um, producers aren't getting a lot of money from Google to produce this content. It depends upon the channel and the celebrity uh, concerned, but the budgets are dramatically compressed. You know, we're talking, if you're getting, you know, 250,000 bucks for an hour, um, you're doing pretty well. And a lot of digital producers in the United States actually produce for a lot less than that. But the way that YouTube uh, does business is they give an advance against advertising revenue. Um, and we've been hearing that their initial negotiations with advertisers have been very fruitful. Um, and they, you know, they intend to uh, monetize big time the, uh, the content that they've commissioned. And so they give an advance to the producer. Once they've recouped their advance through ad sales, they split the ad revenue 50-50. Um, so, uh, just a couple of the key findings. Um, the first is this phenomenon of videofication, which refers to the fact that, for example, um, Yahoo, which has 180 million unique visitors every day to its website, and also has, or has consistently had for months and months, the top 10 online video web series uh, in the world. It's moving more and more and more to creating original digital content uh, for its platform. Um, and the purpose of it, of course, is the YouTubes of this world have a problem in that they have massive scale, huge numbers of people going to their site, but they're not necessarily staying there very long and they're not engaging with the content very much. And so the whole drive towards original, more professionally produced content is to incre increase that uh, audience engagement. Already mentioned, of course, the, the, the phenomenon of Canadians sort of leading the field when it comes to online video consumption. And then, of course, the other big question is, um, the, the, the YouTubes and the Googles, they do have offices here, um, but obviously they're all US-based. And the, the big question is, how do we begin refashioning the, the current financing tools that are available um, to enable Canadian producers to do deals with the Googles of this world and begin accessing that digital marketplace. And other jurisdictions, like this one, are more ahead of the curve than others. We've got a challenge at the federal level, for example, with the federal tax credit. And then we might have to look at other triggers for traditional content, like the CMF, you, re you require a broadcaster license in order to trigger Canada Media Fund funding. Does that make sense, given where everything is going here? Um, and I think that's it, so I'll leave it at that, and thanks again to the OMDC for sponsoring this report. <laughs>